Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hi, I'm Cray Price with the International Water Training Institute. I'm pleased to be hosting today's webinar for the Australian Water School. Today, we're going to be talking about droughts. We're going to bring on some experts who will be telling us not only about the alarming situation globally, but also covering some solutions that can help lessen the impacts. Let's start out by welcoming all of you um, from around the world, about uh, 600 registrants uh, for this webinar with global implications. So welcome to everybody. We hope to bring you in some engaging content today. So let's bring on our presenters for today. If you can all turn on your cameras, uh, we've got Mike, Steve, and Declan joining us live. We'll have some uh, messages from Professor Kathy Jacobs as well toward the end. First of all, let's uh, introduce you to our experts today um, who will be bringing you this content and addressing some of your questions. Um, first question then um, over to you, if you can turn your mics on, Mike, um, your visit to Australia. I know you were here um, at, for an FMA conference, Mike. Um, what were your impressions of Australia and um, where where are you at these days? Um, absolutely fantastic. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, ended up going to my first rugby game and uh, was told, <laughs> told to wear blue in Queensland. Um, it, it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mike's uh, going to be talking to us about some uh, issues in the American West, um, where also Steve Bilson is located. Um, Steve and I go way back. I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, going forward. But um, Steve uh, works for a uh, company or runs a company called Rewater, uh, which is a gray water recycling company or a gray water irrigation company. Um, Steve, uh, when, when are you going to expand into Australia? Uh, when are you going to be here next and start, uh, start a little uh, um, uh, enterprise out this way? Uh, I was kind of hoping to retire there, not work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there you go. That'd be the best. Um, give us a little bit of an introduction. Uh, where are you coming to us from today? Thousand Oaks, California. Thousand Oaks, all right. Sounds good. Well, uh, we'll hear from Steve then about uh, the situation right now with uh, with gray water recycling, one of the um, uh, methods that uh, can be applied uh, for helping to solve some of the shortages, which will be a bit, we'll, we'll hear some alarming stories today um, and some alarming projections, but we don't want to leave you without some uh, potential solutions. Declan, um, here in Australia for us, give us a little bit about your background, tell us where you're coming to us from and uh, what you do for your career and how that involves droughts. Sure thing, Craig. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Declan Page. I'm a, I'm a scientist with the Groundwater Systems Group at CSIRO. Now, CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, the Australian National Federal Science Agency. I live in, um, in Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia, but it's often built as the driest state in the driest continent in the world. Um, so we do a lot of work with um, well, groundwater. My background is actually in water quality and treatment management, and I've done a lot of work with utilities. But probably what we're most known for is um, managed actual recharge and water banking and water recycling via aquifers. Excellent. All right. Well, what's uh, the way this is going to work? Um, I'm going to kick off with a little bit of an introduction of the topic. Um, then we're going to have Mike share a bit of a global situation going on, kind of a big picture. Um, Steve is going to give us some local uh, solutions that um, we can apply um, that might help ease the uh, the situation. Um, I know climate change will come up a lot, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, fighting climate change. We've got other webinars on that um, today. It's about uh, the projections. What do we do with the situation, and do we expect this um, to to worsen um, or improve uh, going forward. So in the background, um, I have set up a website here, surfacewater.biz slash drought. We're gonna post all the resources that you see today, even live through the chat line. Um, I'll post these to this website so that you can see um, some of the uh, resources that we'll be covering um, and uh, have more information about it. There's only so much we can pack into 60 minutes. And so we will want to always give you additional content for those who are interested in it. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is our friend Grady Hillhouse of Practical Engineering. Um, he's been on some of our HEC RAS, uh, uh, channels here and um, uh, has got some awesome content um, that help us to define some of these situations. Um, just has a recent video on the uh, lowest level on record. Um, and I want to just uh, highlight a couple of things here for you on uh, on this video, at least, um, where he's going to, um, if you if you have a look here, um, he's he's asks a couple of questions. Um, and I want to just frame these questions up for us today. One is about water storage. So if our reservoirs are water storage reservoirs, um, wouldn't it make sense to size those reservoirs to be empty every once in a while. So everybody's alarmed, Lake Mead and you know, hitting these, these amazingly low levels. But if you were optimally sizing a reservoir for water storage, shouldn't it go dry every once in a while? So 
does a question for you. Um, you know, and keep some of the we can have some of these responses go on through the panel discussion. But um, I would encourage you to watch this. this is about a ten minute video, um, and it just really paints uh, the picture here of what's going on. And another thing that he highlights in this video is a dam that was constructed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers here in uh, uh, in Oklahoma, and. Uh, it was constructed based on projections of water uh, water yield. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that water was coming in, I think, from groundwater sources that ended up getting tapped. And it was built and it remained bone dry <laughs> from the day it was built. And so, you know, that's a question uh, for you. You know, these projections that we've based all of our um, kind of our science on um, in, uh, you know, well, we, we look back on the science and we've based our infrastructure on these projections of what happened in the past, if that's going to change, if that's not stationary, watch out. And that can be both directions. That can be the droughts and it can be the flooding rains. So if we have reservoirs based on previous uh, size, based on previous projections, those might not hold anymore. And so we might be wasting our money or our efforts there. If we have uh, infrastructure that's sized for flood mitigation and it's based on previous meteorology, well, if it's non-stationary, watch out. Um, that could have a human safety uh, issue in addition to the economic consequences and further uh, drastically environment, uh, drastic environmental scenarios and uh, consequences. Um, one of the just, uh, when, I, when I moved to Australia with my family about 12 years ago, it was in the middle of a drought and massive drought, millennium drought, they called it. And uh, my kids had to learn this poem, uh, which was written over a hundred years ago about the sunburnt country. Bill Bryson has a manual here. It's designed to scare you about uh, Australia with the uh, poisonous species and everything, but uh, he references this as well. Uh, it was a land of droughts and flooding rain because within a year or two, we had some of the worst floods on record after this massive drought. Now that was Australia where species have adapted to this sort of climate and these sorts of extremes. Now we're seeing these kinds of extremes all over the place in areas where we might, might not be able to adapt so quickly. So um, what, uh, and, and, and there will be massive consequences as well environmentally if some of these levels keep up, um, there will be further extinctions. What do we do about it and how can we help uh, with this situation? And Arnold, um, if you've uh, seen uh, Ar Arnold's uh, presentation here, um, he's done a couple of interviews and I won't play the audio for you, but he uh, is out there chanting, we need water, we need water, we need water. Well, there you are in California. We've got uh, that situation we'll hear about here uh, from our presenters um, about the situation in the American West, which is, uh, you know, applicable globally as well. So I hope for you as a global audience, um, you're able to uh, get something out of this wherever you're coming to us from. And let us know what of these topics do you want to see more of as we plan out our agenda for next year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, Mike, if you can share your screen, let's hear a little bit about the situation in the American West. What's going on there? Um, you know, are you optimistic, pessimistic about the future? Uh, let's hear a bit about that, and then Steve will show us uh, some potential solutions. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. My name is uh, Mike McMahon. <coughs> I'm with HDR. I'm Senior Hydro Meteorologist, Climate Science and Resiliency Lead for the company based in Denver, where it's a balmy 35 degrees right now. So Cray asked me to provide an example of uh, a large river basin that is suffering from a drought right now. Now, I granted, I had my pick of uh, many rivers in Europe, uh, as well as many rivers in North America. But uh, we had recently done an integrated water um, supply management study for um, a city in Arizona. So um, the Colorado River Basement uh, was a natural pick for that. Now, um, got the date right. So I was very happy with that. And everything you'll see is in metric. So very happy with that. I actually worked for Lockheed and Boeing for 22 years doing global um, uh, operations and research, and even used to forecast for the Royal Australian Air Force long ago. Um, anyway, the drought that I'm going to be talking about uh, began in the year 2000, but it is definitely not your normal drought. Uh, give you a little breakdown on the Colorado River Basin. It's 640,000 square kilometers. Um, it is provides water supply for four, 40 million people. Um, many of which are in Southern California, but also in uh, seven different states in the um, Southwestern United States. And uh, the average annual water volume at Lee's Ferry, which is where that red circle is, is uh, 17,268 uh, gigaliters. And then um, the total system storage is 41,938 gigaliters. Um, uh, quite impressive, except for the fact that the current system is only 31% full 
So that does indeed cause a problem. Um, so before I tell you about um, the why of this mega drought, um, <clears throat> I wanna let you know that um, uh, all the graphs that you're gonna see are actually original uh, from the work that we did uh, in Arizona recently. We're in, we went and uh, gathered data from all the blue dots you see on the map there um, and uh, reanalyzed uh, what had been analyzed about 20 years ago in the Colorado River Basin and um, made some very, very interesting findings about the last 22 years. Um, this climate analysis for the Colorado River Basin included precipitation and hydrologic flow, air temperatures, and precipitation intensities. That was more about situations like you see on the picture on the right uh, than it was about water supply, but we also made considerations for the dry season, the winter wet season, and the monsoon season, which this year's monsoon season, uh, which is brought on uh, by the same mechanisms that bring on the monsoon season in uh, Pakistan and India, uh, was heightened by some very, very hot temperatures early on and started about three weeks early. It is now produced more precipitation than the winter wet season has in Arizona. So everybody's kind of scratching their heads and like, is this the new normal for summertime rainfall in um, Southern California, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. So isn't a drought or especially a mega drought supposed to show a significant change in the long-term trend for precipitation? Well, now granted this is 1896 to 2020 that you're looking at um, and it is annual Colorado River Basin uh, precipitation, that's the whole basin that I just showed you. <clears throat> and the long-term trend is actually increasing in annual precipitation. Now, granted, in the last 22 years, or actually in the case, this, this case, 20 years, um, uh, there have been many years that have been below normal precipitation, but there's four years, actually five years in there, that um, uh, were above the trend. So you'd think if you had a mega drought going on, um, those years that were above the trend would reset it and it wouldn't be that bad. Well, there's other things at work here and, and uh, they are unbelievably important to the health and welfare of every 40 million people that this basin services with water supply. So almost the same time period, little, little shorter on the, on the back end, 1906 to 2022. What you're looking at is the annual water volume that passes by Lee's Ferry, that yellow, I mean, the red circle I showed you on the map, um, uh, in a given year. Now, the numbers on the left are in millions of cubic meters. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a lot of water goes by Lee's Ferry, but look at the trend over time. There's two things working against these river flows at Lee's Ferry. And I'm, I'm gonna explain those and quantify them for you in just a second. This is the first, first culprit. This is the average annual temperature for the Colorado River Basin. All those stations I showed you and that whole area I showed you, um, 1895 to 2018. Now, <clears throat> in North America, uh, we've done numerous studies on climate change. And in every single one of them, the inflection of annual average temperatures happens just about 1977. It shows up constantly. Every city we go to, every, every little small town, every, every field, it shows up that that was the moment in time when warming showed up everywhere. Take a look at this chart. This is the average annual temperature for the entire Colorado River Basin. It took off right about 1975, 1977. And the trend is not the red line. The trend is now at a much steeper angle and headed for a warmer future. That is the one of the culprits that's reducing the flows on the Colorado River. The other one is, of course, demand. Uh, this is from the U.S. Bureau of Re Reclamation, and I apologize. This is the only uh, chart I had to do in, in English measure. 
um, because that's the way it was originally created. But um, uh, it is uh, showing the water use demand and the water supply, the running average over time. Well, let's just say the water supply is going down and the demand went up here, then conservation kicked in and it settled down right around um, 15 million uh, acre feet a year. Uh, problem being, the projected water demand continues to go up and the projected water supply in your running averages goes flat. Um, and uh, that is not a good situation. So you got air, ter air temperature working against you and you have demand working it against you. That's probably because they put a big city of 1.6 million people right in the middle of the desert and it requires a lot of water. Um, that, that's a whole nother story. So what's going to happen in the future? Uh, air temperature projections for the Colorado River Basin indicate that um, uh, the bottom is the temperature increase. The, the uh, y-axis here is the, the density or basically the likelihood that uh, the temperature is going to increase to a, a certain degree. Yellow is uh, for mid-century, so 2050-ish. And then uh, the um, end of century is in red. And then you have the high, uh, the moderate emission scenario and the high emission scenario. So uh, remember these numbers here at the bottom because uh, we're going we're gonna to call this one two and a half and we're going to call this one um, five and a half because that equates to the ugly bottom line. River flows in the Colorado River are expected to decline at a rate of 6.5% per one degree C increase in average annual basin air temperature. That is not a good prospect for a, a, situ a situation where the basin is already in dire need of increased water supplies. The um, uh, Colorado River Basin uh, is only at 31% of the storage that it could be at at this time of year. And um, <clears throat> something needs to be done. So I offer you uh, potential solutions that have been emptied about uh, for the Colorado River Basin. And um, some may become reality, some may become lost in a sea of, of legal, um, <laughs> legal combatants. Um, desal, of course, um, can come from the Gulf of California, um, Pacific Ocean, Salton Sea, or even groundwater because some of the groundwater in Arizona, at least, is uh, uh, quite saline. So it would need to be desal uh, before it goes on. Um, is it possible to desal that much water? Um, uh, I recently visited the UAE and they desal uh, 7 billion liters of water a day. Now they have very inexpensive energy so they can do that. Um, desal is extremely expensive. Um, in the United States because of the energy costs that are involved in desalinization. But when you're running out of water, um, all of a sudden water becomes more valuable and you'll spend money on it. And then there is, of course, reuse. Um, Steve uh, is going to be talking about gray water uh, reuse uh, after uh, I get done. And then you have local supply, which is basically rainwater harvesting. Uh, that is something that is actively pursued in cities like Tucson in Arizona, improve water management, um, which can actually include weather modification. There are many weather modification programs going on in the U.S. Um, at this time. Um, and then uh, imported supplies. This is where it gets kind of crazy. Um, there has been legitimate uh, talk of proposing of uh, building a pipeline and or a canal all the way from the Missouri or Mississippi rivers, uh, either to the Colorado Front Range or to um, a spot on the Colorado River. Um, you can imagine the expense that would be involved in that. But again, water is, is um, uh, a quite an expensive commodity. And then there is demand reduction, which is all about water conservation, which Steve will also be talking to you about. And then modified operations. This is uh, where, where I'm, I, my passion lies, which is um, forecasting informed reservoir operations, basically optimizing 
the operation of your reservoirs to match what your climate is doing in a given year or in the future. And then of course, new storage. And then finally you have water rates uh, changes, which um, I just put ugly because uh, <laughs> uh, changing water rates is not a slow process and um, can end up in the courts for 10, 15 years before anything gets done um, and uh, use a lot of money just on legal fees. Anyway, um, I leave you with those thoughts. And um, uh, I have been told that after we are done here, um, we will uh, be answering questions. Yes. So thanks for those uh, that have come through on the chat line so far. So we've popped in some of the links um, that people have been requesting. Um, uh, Mike, if you want to have a look at that while Steve is presenting, Steve, you can go already go ahead and start sharing your screen uh, so we can get ready for that. One question, though, the term that we've put into the into the title of this webinar um, involved mega drought. And we're not just saying that because it's a super awesome, you know, turbo drought. This is not a, uh, this is a defined term. The term uh, mega drought is uh, a, it's, it's a prolonged drought that lasts two decades or longer. So you can't just throw around the term, like this is a really, really bad drought. It's not about the magnitude of the drought, it's about the duration. Um, so we'll put some extra links to that in there. Um, Steve, I can see your screen just fine. So we're gonna hand it right over to you. Over to you, Steve. Okay, well, uh, gray water irrigation is all that we do at Rewater. So um, this is a topic I'm very familiar with at the, every level. So um, let's define it first. Showers, tub, bathroom sinks, clothes washer water mostly. There's some other sources, but that's where most of it comes from. And in most definitions, it's not from toilets or kitchen sinks. Some people want to say, oh, kitchen sinks are legal sources. But uh, that's pretty nasty stuff. You have all the salmonella, botulism, E. coli, things that can kill you come from the kitchen. So it usually does not include kitchen water. And um, just a little history, there hasn't been a single case of human illness been linked to gray water in California, even though there are over 4 million illegal, quote unquote, gray water systems here. And that's from the state of California. It's like, okay, we're having... As we're talking billions of gallons have been reused over generations and not a single case associated with the human illness. That says something about the safety of gray water. And most of that gray water is applied on the surface. So when you look at um, all the codes want it to be used underground, we're talking about a very safe method of water reuse. And here at a single family level, uh, this is what California came up with. It's, uh, 39 gallons per person per day is the average time 3.2 people in the home is 125 gallons. I'm going to convert some of the stuff to metric stuff later. So 125 gallons times 365 days a year gives you 172 uh, cubic meters per year times 20 years. And that's what you get off of the gray water system with the 20 year life cycle. It's not like the system dies at 20 years. They just have to give it a, a, a term of life. And um, they, funding board people will give it 20 years. And that's rain or shine. No one's gonna stop taking showers. Um, and no one's gonna stop doing laundry, uh, even in the worst droughts. So they might let their uh, lawn go dead, but they won't stink. So um, in the multifamily, the larger systems um, where there's a lot of these catching on because it's, there's the, the return on the investment is incredible. They produce a, a river of water. Um, just a couple of systems here just to give you an idea. Um, you have a hundred uh, two room apartment, you know, double apartment. So you get uh, 10,777 uh, cubic meters per year uh, in a 300 room uh, US Marine Corps barracks. They're getting 16,165 uh, cubic meters a year. These are big flows. These are like, you know, small river type flows every day. It's, um, this is that Marine Corps base, a uh, real picture. This is what it looks like. It's bone dry. I heard earlier that somebody was claiming to have the, the driest part of the world in their purview. Well, we've been out to some pretty dry spots. And, and this is where that one particular group, there's actually six of those uh, 300 room barracks. They each have their own gray water system producing each one's producing a river of water. And, they plant drought tolerant landscape, but they have acres and acres and acres of it. And um, it's it's not like if this is your grandma's gray water system. These are um, pretty sophisticated things. 
Uh, all the filter stuff is hidden down below so the rattlesnakes can't get to it. And um, that's what it actually looks like. Um, you know, you've got your, um, you've got the sewer pipe overflow too and all the gray water goes into a collection tank and is pumped through the sand filter. And it's just, it's very sophisticated and low maintenance because it is so sophisticated. But it's untreated gray water, so you don't have a huge expense in changing the chemical composition or the, uh, you're not killing pathogens because there aren't many pathogens to begin with. You're just putting in underground drip irrigation. And it, therefore, it's very cost effective at this scale. There's a controller we manufacture that does all the automation of that system. These are our patented emitters that keep the emitters from uh, clogging up with the untreated gray water over time. You have a lot of microscopic solids, even after you filter the heck out of gray water, uh, it's still gonna send out these microscopic solids that wanna form a scaling on the inside of the pipes and tubing. And those scales break off in little flakes and um, go out and they clog up conventional emitters. Well, our emitters will pass those right into the soil they break down into plant food, you know, fulvic and humic acids, good for plants, good for the environment. And so the, the big, big question really is, you know, we've been doing this for 32 years. Why hasn't gray water reuse become huge? Why, is, why doesn't every home, every apartment building, every condo, every townhouse, every barracks, um, hotel, motel, why don't they have a gray water system? Well, here's the here's number top three reasons. I'll start with number three. The California Plumbing Code is 13 pages of restrictions for a permit. I looked at the um, various cities in um, Australia, just seeing what Australian permitting issues are, requirements are. It's unbelievably non-restricted compared to California. And California is supposed to be the leader and environmental activism and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. They're just the leader in regulations. And uh, that for a long time was the leading reason why gray water systems weren't huge was because of the tedious process of getting a permit. But then about five years ago, something else popped up. The National Sanitation Foundation said they're gonna get into the gray water business. And they had this new standard 350 for treated gray water. So they're going to kill everything in it, change it completely chemically and pathologically and, and make it benign completely. But they failed to use hair or lint in their gray water test. And that's the main debris in gray water. And so now there are NSF 350 certified gray water systems out there that fail rapidly. It's like, and that's a big problem when you have an industry relying on something like that. But the biggest one, the number one reason why gray water has not become huge is municipal employees want to run what's called, nicknamed toilet to tap, that's also known as direct potable reuse system, where they take city sewer, treat it to a drinking water standard. And the problem with that is, it's like the worst source of water you could start with. It's the same process as desal, the exact same process. But instead of starting with seawater, where you have salt and some sand, you start with sewage, where you have every possible thing known to man is in the city municipal sewer. Um, heavy metals, low activity, radioactivity, um, all sorts of forever chemicals that you cannot get out of the water. It's like forever got problems. And they poured billions and billions into this is what they want to do. And to the exclusion of gray water. So there are the big three killers of gray water becoming huge. And here's the solutions. The codes, when you look at all the codes that, are, that work, um, Arizona, Wyoming, the more recent gray water codes, um, the gray water, the codes are very short. Gray water is for subsurface use. Any fresh water connected to it needs to be protected by a reduced pressure device or an air gap. And no surfacing or ponding of gray water is allowed. I mean, that's where you get your mosquitoes and, and other type of vectors. And so if you just do those three things, then there's no need for, you know, 13 pages of, of code with all these restrictions. Those are the three big ones. 
and the states that are, uh, like I say, the newer states with their newer codes, that's what their codes are looking like. And it's becoming more of a thing quicker in these other states. Um, and the, the, the last one is that all public funding must go to the most cost effective met methods first. When you look at the cost of desalination, there's been a lot of talk about it. Everyone said, oh, it's expensive. Well, I'll throw some numbers on it. It's about $5,000 an acre foot. When you look at the cost of direct potable reuse, because they start with such a nasty source of water, you're talking about maybe $15,000 an acre foot. You look at gray water, according to the State Water Resources Control Board, when they analyze all the costs and benefits, it's like $500 an acre foot. It's the low hanging fruit of the water conservation industry. It is the bargain, the deal. It's a screaming good deal compared to what the options are. But they're privately owned systems. They're owned by whoever owns the apartment building or whoever owns their house or whoever owns that barracks, you know, if it's US government, you know, whatever. Um, it's not a public entity. And so in California, and as California goes, so goes the West is the saying. Um, that is a huge problem because they only put funding into public uh, projects. Even though the US EPA has, they have a rule that says, you're supposed to be able to fund privately owned systems if you, as a municipality or what water district, have the right to inspect the system. But in California, they say, we're just not gonna do it. So that's a huge problem. And they're throwing billions of dollars out there. Uh, you can even look at some of the things that have been passed recently in Congress with the, uh, uh, the debt reduction, the Inflation Reduction Act, that, that's a huge uh, chunk of money going to environmental causes and um, the uh, toilet to tap, direct potable reuse people are really on top of that. And not a dime will go to gray water. Once again, um, they've had five water bonds in California for billions and billions of dollars. Not a dime has gone to gray water. Um, when you look at that Colorado River and um, you look where the water's going, a huge percentage of that goes to California. And they still build hundreds of thousands of homes a year in California. And they still put lawns out there. And it was like, everything's wrong. And, yet, and uh, it's, it's no surprise that they're running out of water. They're pumping mud out of um, Lake Mead. Um, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So um, gray water has been around. Like we've been on, I sponsored the original state gray water law back in 1992, and then the second one, and then the third one. And it's been improved a couple of times since then. And it's highly evolved. It's, you know, it's, Three, three decades of, of use, thousands of our systems out there. It's a proven entity, it's cost effective. There's just some big picture issues that still need to be resolved. I see Australia is much farther along the line, uh, getting their, their code straight and their perspective straight. And I expect that at some point, maybe some company will move to Australia with a uh, proven viable cost-effective system that uh, can help them out uh, with their own water uses and, and needs. <laughs> That's awesome. So that answers our first question then about uh, when you're expanding it, it sounds like, you know, and, and this is one example of the many, many, um, you know, approaches that we can have um, to trying to mitigate or minimize the impacts of the drought um, uh, or the projected water shortages. And you can see it's laced with complications. We're going to have a little bit of a panel discussion here. Um, and, but I guess first, first of all, back to the gray water question. One thing I wanted to, uh, to, to mention is that, you know, back when I was in university at the University of uh, California, Berkeley, um, my, my project, um, I, I looked at things. I was doing hydraulic engineering and all this, but I looked at the projections. And I today, to this day, make my living off of projections, right? I try to simulate water, you know, floods and what's going to happen in the future. I made an incredibly wrong projection at the time. I thought gray water was, wow, the new wave of the future. And Steve has helped explain why this hasn't necessarily taken off. And that's the, you know, the fact that if you were taking water out of your shower and putting it onto a lawn and then it's gone, well, the municipalities are better off taking that water 
putting a rock garden in, don't put it on the lawn, take it and resell it. Since it came from far away to begin with, you can resell it seven or eight times as it gets pumped back upstream and comes back through your house. So there are other things at work here. Um, we, I wanted to present this as an example. Um, you know, I thought, you know, uh, Greywater company getting in at the, you know, the ground floor way back when was going to turn out like Tesla or something. It seemed like a no brainer, but they're laced with complications. Every one of the water conservation measures that we try to implement, all the municipalities will tell you, you know, there, it's not just a simple, straightforward answer. So we wanted to present the big picture, bring it back to a residential lot scale. What are some things that you can do to help uh, promote that? Um, we've got, we're now joined by um, Catherine Jacobs. Um, we're going to start a bit of a panel discussion. Thanks for, uh, to Steve and Mike and Declan and Kathy for um, answering some of these questions in the background on the Q&A line. Keep those questions coming. Um, a couple of questions then that I wanted to ask you, uh, Kathy, she's a, a professor at um, uh, Arizona, University of Arizona um, in environmental science. And I wanted to just um, ask you, uh, your opinion uh, after seeing all of this and uh, studying this and knowing the science behind it you know we, we asked the, the 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 question of the uh attendees here is this a once in a lifetime uh event like the press is saying um they all thought uh 85 said no do you agree with that or um are you what, what what's your outlook on this is this a once in a lifetime drought that we're seeing I think anyone who has been uh, listening to it, climate experts about what's expected in the context of climate change, we are looking at more extreme events, both floods and droughts. And certainly the, what we've been seeing across the world is, is actually um, a dramatic new version of that, but not at, at all unexpected. Part of what we've been looking for and now seeing is um, drying across the mid latitudes. And so that's happening as well as um, these extreme events. Um, but there's, there's no doubt that this is really consistent with a long-term trend. So it's not gonna go back to whatever we all thought was normal in the past, and we should expect continuing extremes. Thanks. And that's uh, straight from uh, somebody studying the science on this thing. Um, what can uh, we got hundreds of water professionals who have the ability, the capability, the capacity, the uh, the qualifications, um, the potential to make a difference uh, in the world, in the water sector. Um, what can we as the you know, as an average water professional out there, um, what what's your best bang for the buck? Um, where should we be focusing our efforts and how can the average water professional help to avert future water shortage crises? Well, that's a, a pretty uh, tall question you're asking me. Um, I do have about 23 years of experience as a water manager for the state of Arizona prior to being a faculty member and have spent almost 40 years looking at the intersection of, of climate and water and conservation issues and so forth. I guess my perspective is we need to be ready for a range of possible futures. And that really means that scenario planning can be very helpful. The way scenario planning is normally used, you sort of look at a wet future and a dry future and a cold future and a hot future. Um, I wouldn't recommend that in particular if what you're trying to do is be prepared for a range of really major risks. Um, I would look at the intersection of multiple risks, which include you know, heat and drought, um, wildfire, air quality issues, and how those things might affect your system and be prepared for those kind of intersecting risks as opposed to you know, just individual problems with, with heat or drought. Uh, we've done that with the Colorado River in a project called the Colorado River Conversations Project where we actually um, brought people from all seven basin states in Mexico together to really talk about what, what future conditions they were most concerned about. And then we also asked them to identify solutions that might, might actually be good under multiple circumstances. Um, so would they were able to do that and it was a very useful conversation sort of helped build a foundation of trust across the basin. So I think that's one important path forward. But I think the other is really just understanding that we can't just be planning for a median future. We have to actually be prepared to deal with significant risk more even than we've seen today. And if we wanna see water continue to come out of the taps, we need to plan for 
the extreme end of the conditions, not just the median. Ah, excellent. No, thanks for your input. Um, have a look at the chat line. There's uh, in the Q and A line. Uh, there's plenty of other questions that um, we've we've been very busy in the background, and a, a lot of them have been answered. But there's a few more that uh, I think you might be able to weigh in on. Um, uh, Mike Kaniski was just uh, watching in the background. He thought he'd just attend passively today, but I wanted to call him out and bring him up here just to show you. Um, he's one of our teachers for the um, hydrology and hydraulics essentials course series, um, who has uh, some expertise in these projections and how you. Can figure out yourself by looking at the data don't you don't have to trust everybody else on this pull your own data do these projections and you'll see non-stationarity so uh, michael answer a couple of your questions in the background wanted to turn over to declan too, um give him a chance to shine here um and let us know what he's been working on in the background here and some of the questions he's been answering i see a couple about groundwater quality there um that i'm not qualified to answer um maybe uh if you wanted to give some of those a stab or uh any of those other questions that you've that might bring this discussion from a global perspective and all these american accents on here over to an australian we are the australian water school so we we want to make sure we bring you an Australian perspective as well. So, uh, Declan, um, hit us with anything sure you'd like to hit from the uh, Q and A line. Okay. Um, look, I didn't ask the question before. I thought they're better addressed by the other speakers. However, look, there are a couple here for Australia. So, one of them is about um, the increasingly uh, stringent requirements of effluent disposal with the environment, um, and why not go to the next level, such as indirect potable reuse by Adam Turville. Um, look, I. I I'd add to that, look, Australia is particularly blessed in terms of our regulatory environment. So we have a, a risk-based regulatory system. So not everything needs to be treated to drinking water standards. So for example, irrigation water um, is treated to a much lower level um, than it is than is drinking water quality. And for that reason, a lot of our wastewater and grey water and other reuse systems have really have really been able to prosper under this regulatory environment. So the comparison, for example, between um, you know, grey water quality and and direct pot direct potable reuse, that's quite that's quite different because they're treated at very different standards. Um, why not go to indirect potable reuse? And well, indeed we are here in Australia. So towns like um Perth, big town on the west coast, a couple of million people, now will get about 20% of their water supply through um water recycling via aquifers, also known as managed aquifer recharge. They take municipal wastewater, treat it to a high standard, frankly, they're drinking water standard, they over treat it to some degree, but I need to do that for public confidence. It's then injected into an aquifer, sits there for 50 years before it's recovered again and put back in, in, in a municipal system. And it's these sort of these sort of schemes that are world class and are really getting the attention and actually making a difference in terms of for towns like Perth, which has frankly never come out of drought, been a step change in their in their climate over there. Um, in terms of one of the questions was about grey water reuse and effects of groundwater. Uh, yes, I guess the volumes are pretty small. You need to be careful there, of course, um, and as well as about grey, grey water disposal. Um, again, we have quite quite good guidelines. They're risk based, um, and it, and it will go into depending on the use and soil types and etc. of how one would construct one of these systems. So they're all different, and it depends. But that's really what gives it the flexibility, and has led to its uptake. Great. Well, thanks for that uh, that response. I see there's quite a few uh, in the background that I think, Steve, there's some pretty technical questions um, uh, specifically about uh, about gray water. Um, as you're hitting those, let's turn first back over to Mike, because Mike, I saw a bunch of questions coming in while Steve was presenting. Um, we'll see if you can get uh, a couple of those ready for uh, live uh, discussion. Uh, Mike, if you can restate the question as well, anything you see on there that you wanted to hit um, of the many that you've addressed um, that maybe potentially the ones that have been upvoted the most. Um, over to you, Mike. <clears throat> so uh, there were quite a few questions uh, regarding the data as, as to where the data came from and, and how it was analyzed. And one of them is uh, uh, how were the trends in precipitation water volume calculated uh, with the man Kendall or a simple linear regression? Actually, it's even simpler than that. Um, it was all observed data. And uh, I it just used simple linear regression uh, to calculate the, the trends um, in Excel. Um, uh, so uh, uh, nothing fancy about it. However, um, it was all about uh, perspective um, on the climate trends that were in, impacting the Colorado River Basin. Um, had the same question that you answered already, which was, how do you define mega drought? I appreciate that. Um, uh, this one, I, I, I wasn't really sure of, but I, I answered it anyway. Ah. Um, it has a cumulative deviation from the mean residual rainfall. And then there's a word I, I assume was graph, um, uh, been plotted uh, for the rainfall. 
Uh, uh, yes, we did. Um, but um, in the short time I was able to uh, present, uh, I did not um, choose that one uh, to present. But um, it's a, that's a very good ask. And uh, it was actually an ask from our client um, in the project that we did for the Colorado River Basin. Uh, by the way, the, the, uh, the next question is the air temperature projections for the Colorado River Basin. What is the baseline period for these projection increases? And if Kathy Jacobs was watching my presentation, she saw one of her um, graphs uh, from one of her reports, uh, which showed air temperature projections. Um, uh, I was going to assume the baseline was the last 30 years, Kathy, um, but uh, maybe you could answer that one for me. So um, the work that I've done has been primarily focused on uh, precipitation and, and temperature but it is related to um, looking at the most recent 20 years because they're, they call that the stress test um, because it's the last 22 years on the Colorado River Basin have been much um, hotter and drier than prior years. And so rather than using 30 years, which is normal um, for these kinds of things, I think the Bureau of Reclamation has chosen a shorter time period that's more stressful to try to be more real realistic. Um, so I, I cannot thank you enough for that because that was the exact answer I gave. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's good when there's some consistency here. Exactly. Um, excellent. Um, so, uh, St Steve, um, any any if you want to just choose uh, one of the one of the comments that have come in or the questions about uh, gray water recycling um, or gray water irrigation um, and just highlight it for the audience, recognizing that we're going to be able to put a whole bunch of resources, um, including the question on there's a question on cost benefit ratios. Hey, nobody's ever asked me in 25 years what my master's uh, project was on, and it was on gray water recycling together with Steve. And so, um, yeah, I did a cost benefit analysis and um, showed that there were great cost uh, you know it was it was a it was a, uh, a good return on your investment um and so that's why i was a little bit surprised when it uh, when it didn't end up taking off um steve over to you with uh, any selected question you wanted to hit well i did answer a number just a, a minute ago um while we were going through this i wanted to uh, try to connect with a few people that weren't getting responded to so um on the cost benefit uh, issue because that's that's a big one um with rain you have to store it, so you have to you have to buy a big, huge storage tank, and that is a, a big hit. With gray water, you don't do that. You use it every day as it's produced. You have a very small system relative to the amount of water going through it. So it's as you crunched out thirty years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's a bargain. It really is a bargain when they compare it to anything else on their state water resources control board. Said it's the most cost effective source of water they have ever had go through their office. That's a huge statement. So that's, you know, that guy had been there for a long time. He surely hadn't been back in the 60s or 50s or something. But for when you compare gray water irrigation to rainwater harvesting or desalination or uh, direct potable reuse, and you look at those cost benefit analysis, you know, we put the pros and the cons together. Gray water always comes out a screaming bargain. So that's what I would just remind everybody of. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Um, my, when I say Mike, I need to specify here. We've got two mics on the call. Mike K. Um, question for you um, when, as we're talking about costs and benefits. Um, Non-stationarity, if you can just kind of define that term, because it is something that came up in some of our curve fitting um, webinars and uh, courses. Um, how, how do you see non-stationarity um, or <laughs> um, affecting uh, basically uh, cost benefit projections going forward? How, how would that influence um, a previous study, which I would have done, you know, 30 years ago on this? I wasn't going with non-stationarity. Now that we build that in, how's that going to affect our cost benefit ratios for uh, proposed infrastructures and where we should focus our the bang for the buck in water conservation measures? Thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I would first ask like, who here has truly seen a stationary hydrologic data set? And if you do, uh, I'll, I'll buy you a beer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you, you, as we go through and we start realizing that the non-stationarity or the implications we're starting to see are are the change is accelerating and and so when we have to do that in the cost benefit analysis we start to 
have to really project out the uncertainty, you know, 10, 20, 40, 50, 70 years in the future. And, and people are doing that. You know, one of the things that um, like the California Department of Water Resources has done, and it should be out any day now with the 2020 to Central Valley floodplain protection plan is they took and down, they, they use climate models to estimate projections of future temperature and precip and then fit frequency curves to those protection, those projections and scaled up the current curves and the current uncertainty estimates using that information to project what the 2072 possible conditions are going to be in the system. And for those not familiar with California hydrology, we have 1,400 miles of levy uh, that the state is responsible for. And so that they're, based on those projections, they're able to focus where they need to invest their money um, or, or prioritize fixes. And I think that that's, that's the sort of thing that is happening right now. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for that response. Yeah. Um, that's uh, they, we're going to post some more information for you, and all of these questions that uh, like Steve's been answering a bunch of these about uh, specific to gray water. Um, Mike's got a few of these in the background, Declan as well. Um, it, all of these uh, questions. What we're going to do is uh, take the Q and A responses, the PDF file, and we'll post those to that resources page, um, surfacewater.biz/drought, um, and to the Australian Water Schools site as well, so that you can um, have uh, so that everybody can peruse those at your leisure. So we've got just a couple minutes to go. Um, wanted to just give everybody a chance to give some closing remarks, some advice uh, for future generations here, uh, based on what you've seen, what you've observed. Um, I think we've all got some years uh, uh, behind us in in our careers. Um, you know, f from what we've studied, what we know about, um, you know, give give us some closing closing remarks on this topic, and you know, let's help to steer our content for next year. Any of these things, we could have picked any of the water conservation measures. We picked gray water uh, just for today. Um, next year for our uh, webinar series, um, we may need to focus a little more on the environmental impacts of uh, the, you know, some of these uh, extreme scenarios. Um, you know, what do you want to hear more of? Um, it, we'll we'll make sure that we give you a chance to respond on that. So uh, to each of the speakers, let's uh, you know, thanks for coming on board. These are volunteers um, for you today. Um, we are volunteering our time uh, to get this information across to you. Um, I hope you found it valuable. Um, thanks to the speakers for coming on. Um, we'll have in the background as we're giving our closing remarks a couple of slides showing um, some of the um, uh, some of the future resources that are coming up uh, through the Australian Water School. Um, and you know, keep in mind you can get continuing professional development hours for these. Uh, so in the future, you know, going forward, if you want to get your lunchtime hour, um, come on board and join us again for the next webinars. So let's uh, go back through um, in the order we presented. Um, let's start with uh, Mike and then Steve and then. Uh, uh, Kathy and Declan with some closing remarks. So over to you first, Mike M. Thank you again, Craig. Uh, this was fantastic. It's a great opportunity to uh, really, um, we, we don't get too many opportunities to um, voice an opinion as well as a professional opinion. And to this audience, it is truly an honor. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and welcome it again. Sounds good. Okay, excellent. Uh, Steve, uh, over to you, closing remarks. Well, thanks for letting me um, share what I've experienced over 32 years of gray water irrigation. And um, I hope people uh, take it away as a, a viable proven method, not you know, an experiment that goes on and on and on and on and on. It's, you know, it's an answer. It's, it's readily off the shelf, as they say. Excellent. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Kathy, over to you. I guess I'd just like to say that water managers really are in a place where you can make a huge difference, not just because you have the capacity to interact with you know, millions of customers, but you actually make a lot of decisions that affect greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's the way you use energy in your own systems, to pump water, vehicles, et cetera, but you also are really at the crux of the issue in terms of impacts and adaptation. So you're really in a position of leadership, and I hope everyone takes that mantle and runs with it. Excellent. Thanks for that advice. Um, Declan, our lone Australian voice here, uh, uh, take, it, take it, bring it home for us. Thanks, Craig. Um, I don't need to say, look, droughts are here to stay. They're here to stay in Australia. They're here to stay in California. It's time we built, um, I think, more anticipatory systems for water management. Um, we know they're coming. Let's plan for it and prepare for it, especially at times like right now in Australia where it's wet. We should be preparing for drought today. 
That's great. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Now, we are excited next month to bring you uh, Bo Miles. A present uh, you see this here, Bad River. Um, this is one of the first times we're actually going to assign homework. So join us next month. You won't want to miss this one. Um, you have assigned homework, though. You need to watch this uh, uh, YouTube clip here, uh, Bad River, where uh, <laughs> Bo Miles kayaks down the sickest uh, urban river in Australia. Um, you might think from some of those screenshots, um, this is coming from some other place with uh, possibly uh, the infrastructure might, uh, you know, might, might, might not uh, be of the same standard um, as that uh, we have in Australia, but um, it's not. That's right here in Australia. And um, he's going to show his experiences with us. Um, it'll be like a meet the author kind of thing. He produced this video uh, within a week. I think it had a million views. Um, so Bo's going to be with us and uh, you'll get a chance to interact with him uh, on, on that one. And then the, the following month, we're going to be talking about some other kayakers. We, we kicked this year off with a kayaker, an Olympic kayaker doing the hydraulics and the 3D CFD modeling of uh, Olympic whitewater rafting courses. We're going to close out the year with a couple of kayaking things as well, including the, um, the, the activists who helped uh, kayak down the LA River and got that uh, monstrosity that you see in all the movies um, uh, designated um, to uh, for some of the protections that it currently has. So don't miss those. Um, we uh, we do look forward to uh, joining uh, joining you on those future webinars. But um, next year is wide open. Let us know. Uh, we're planning those out over the next few weeks. We're going to have those locked in. Give us your feedback so we can bring you what you want to hear. So with that, thanks uh, again for your time today with the Australian Water School. Um, I'm Cray Price and uh, hope to see you again Again, next time, thanks to all your, the presenters that joined us today. We'll see you again next time on the Australian Water Schools webinar channel. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water visit theaustralianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.